the end of this, if she doesn't do an, a leg drop on me, we'll have done something wrong. <laughs> Welcome to Vancouver, all. Jen. Thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. How is everybody? <laughs> Good. So let's talk. What do you want to talk about? Yeah, see, they're happy too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, mentioned the art, I mentioned the Art of Money. We, we actually we got somebody right here who's a big fan, already oh, a listener. Oh, yes. Oh, I love that. It's a baby podcast. It was just born this year, so it's it's great. It's I mean it's it's a mixture of the things that I that I love talking to you about, which is not just the business, not just the artistry of the work that you do, but there there is a business side to the business that oh, yeah. not everybody thinks about. Yeah, you know, when I mean you 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 made you made you're still you're still eating out on Metal Gear Solid money, aren't you? No. <laughs> <laughs> little little point of fact. Let's see, the first Metal Gear was done way back when, when our, our SAG pay rate was just under $600. And I did two sessions, and I was one of the female leads, you know, Naomi Hunter. And, and, and I don't, I'm not mad about this at all, it's the state of the industry. Um, but just to clear up a misconception, uh, so I made just under $1,200 for Metal Gear, and the game grossed $276 million. Had I been an on-camera actor in that same circumstance, my financial future would have been significantly different. But I'm not. I'm a voice actor. And that is a common misconception. How many people out here are pretty sure the first thing they heard her voice in was Metal Gear? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, fan ever since, right? Does anybody know the first game I actually did? Over here. Oh, back, back there. Nope. No. Up here? Nope. Anybody else? I don't think Luigi? Nope. Diego? Boom! <laughs> there we go. You won, you win the no prize, sir. <laughs> I have a glass. I have a glass of water for you. Yep. So I, everybody everybody has a different story of getting into voice acting. A common question is, oh, how do I get into being a voice actor? And and I find everybody has a different story, but but one of the commonalities is. You, you become an actor first, you become a yes. performer first, and it is something that is, that is part of that journey. What, what led your route to, uh, to voice acting? Uh, a lovely woman named Jane Trexel, a lovely dude named Leo Toshelli, and a place called the Alabama School of Fine Arts, and I need a job. Um, I went to a fine arts high school, and my mother was very particular about the way that, we, uh, that I spoke and came across for her own reasons and um, so between those two things I lived down south and I could speak without a southern accent I got a job at a video production studio thanks to Leo and then my my dear dear friend to this day Jane Trexel had recommended me for something and that's how I met Leo I was a PA at a little tiny production house and at a little tiny in a small market when you're a production assistant you do everything from get coffee to frame up shots to carry equipment to file things to wrap an extension cord around your boss as he ties into the giant electrical panel at the museum in case he starts getting electrocuted and you can pull him off. Um, so I was doing that job. And there was an audio studio next door, Batwell Studios, love them. And they called me over to see if I could just do a quick voice on something. And they paid me $30 and I was still a teenager and I was like, wait, what? <laughs> what? And I'm, I've always had my, <laughs> my dad used to very affectionately call me the little capitalist piglet. <laughs> and I, yeah, oink, yeah. oink, daddy, oink, yeah, oink. you know, I mean, I love my dad. And uh, so I, I, I was like, wait, $30? What? <laughs> what? And when you're, you know, still in high school, you're like, holy cow. Um, so I made the guys there, Greg and Courtney, teach me how to do this. I used to go over to them and, and like, here's my demo. How is it? And they're like, yeah, okay. And I'd listen to it. And two months later, I'd be like, it's not good enough. I want to do it again. And I'd fork out all this money to redo my demo, and they taught me everything, and I went door to door to ad agencies cold calling them to get uh, work, and I just suddenly got really loud. Um, is that me? Did that really happen? No, they're rebalancing. Oh, okay, got it. Um, and, Phantom AV. Right? And then um, I then created, I maxed out in the Birmingham market, and I started driving to Atlanta to get more work. And um, The real big city. The big city, the big city. And, uh, down on Peach Tree. Down on Peach Tree, right down there. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, that's when I, I actually had had a theater scholarship in college a couple of years after I started in the business. And, and, um, but it wasn't really my movie. I was singing in clubs at the time. It was like, that's what I wanted. And that style of acting that they were doing wasn't my thing. And um, I went to Atlanta just to get more you know, commercial work and improve my bottom line. 
got my first audition for a film and I booked it and I was like, okay, now this acting makes sense to me, but you're absolutely right. I started with the School of Fine Arts, learning how to act. That's a long answer to your question. No, it's the, the, this, this is why we love the answers that you give to questions. Because <laughs> just, they're really long. There's, there's <laughs> texture and richness and detail to them. So, so let's, let's say, let's say uh, you know, me or maybe somebody in the audience is in the same kind of position of, of trying to find a way. Maybe they have an in. They have somebody that offers them that $30 uh, voice acting gig, mm -hmm. that first uh, taste of something. How... how how do you package yourself as a product uh, for these people? You don't package yourself yet until you're ready to be a product. What you do in the beginning, phase one, is just to get out there into the community. If somebody has offered you, you know, 30, 40, 50 dollars or, or no dollars for, uh, um, to do some voice acting, put yourself out there to work for anybody for any price, for free or whatever, and just start seeing what keeps coming up for you. Um, maybe you're a utility player. I actually am a utility player. That's always been my strength. And I have ended up being the either the bossy, super bossy one who saves the universe or the really insane one who destroys it. Um, that's kind of like what I keep doing. It's so much fun. Um, honestly, there's a few things to do, which is get connected out there. Start listening to the people you really like and start to break it down. Why do you like it? What is it about it that you like? And, and copy it for yourself. Be very careful though, you have to do one thing in your head first. That will take you your entire life to complete, if you ever do. But I want you to hold it as a guidepost. And that is you have to cease all self-judgment. And you have to learn how to self-assess without self-judging. Does that make sense? Anybody out there recorded themselves and gone, oh, I can't stand the sound of my own voice. Like, it's terrible to yeah, listen to this. I had that. I mean, for like two, three years, I was like, oh my God. You know, and you get past that, and then you can really hear yourself. And it's about six months after that when you stop giggling, when you, oh, you don't do that anymore. Oh, man, you guys are missing out on the coolest thing. See, when I first started, everything was on tape. Way back in the old days, before digital, everything was on tape. And when they would rewind, you would hear the... You know, and they would fast forward, you'd be like, Hee! and I remember, I remember the day that I was like, I didn't even laugh. I was like, oh no, I'm not new anymore. It doesn't make me laugh anymore. I'm like, oh yeah, that's the sound it makes when you fast forward in reverse, whatever. Okay, so once you're, you know, the self-judgment just, it's the kindness thing. And honestly, we could use this on the planet anyway, and you're in Canada, so it'll be easier because it's culturally popular. Um, be kind to yourself. And in being kind to yourself, you'll be kinder to others, etc. But you'll also have room for your creativity because there are, I recognized early on there's two of us. There's the creative us, which comes from that kid part of us, and then there's the business us, which is like, hmm, that's not going to sell, or that's going to work, or that's not going to work. And you need to separate them. And when you go in to do the take, let the kid just go, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. you know, okay, well, let's take a look at that. And then you're the other person expanding it. So you need to be those two people. Yeah. One of the things that I've, that as, as I consider myself a baby voice actor, because I've, I've done some industrial <laughs> stuff, I've done yeah. this, that, and the other. You know, I grew, I grew up listening to, to Rob and Maurice uh, yeah. do their characters. Rob Paulson, Maurice LaMarche, anybody seen them here at the show? Yeah. And I found, myself, I found myself doing my versions of some of the voices that they did and finding my own voice for particular types and characters. Now you have to take a stand for those voices and really take a stand for that they have value. Everyone, listen. Uh, listen, <laughs> listen as I introduce the one, the only Jennifer Hale, the one at Campbell Playhouse. I'm Orson Welles. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tonight, Jen does a one-woman performance of the Magnificent Ambersons, a novel by Booth Tarkington. There you go. Yeah, you, know, you got to play with it. You got to, you got to have fun. You got to find your, your yeah. fun for your things. Your version. Your version. Yeah. And there's some technical stuff. I mean, um, my kid taught me this when he learned how to read. His teacher in first grade gave him. Um, they had to read for 10 minutes a night, and he was like, ah, you know, you put it in front of math, he's like, ooh, we read it, he's like, ah, you know, but he did it every night, and it was like pulling teeth for the first, you know, few months, and then he started to do it on his own, and by the end of the year, he's like, oh, yeah, uh, Seattle's best, copy it, you know, and I'm like, oh my god, he did it, he did the, you know, I made him do the 10 minutes a day, and he nailed it, and I was like, I knew this, and I've not been doing this for skills that I want and things that I want. So if you want to be a voice actor, 
go to Google, Yahoo, whatever, and just pick a paragraph, pick up something that's, you know, junk mail that gets dropped at your door and read it out loud every single day and record it and make it make sense. And by the end of that year, you're going to be like, oh yeah, hand me anything. What do you need? You know? Yeah. You know, just start reading the beginning of novels, that kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, Dee Baker. <laughs> I love him so much. He, when he walks his dogs, he takes a book with him and he reads it out loud. <laughs> I said to him, I said, do people avoid you on the street? <laughs> Walking around like Belle and Beauty and the Beast yeah, reading. you know, and he'll do it out loud. I'm like, or do you have train of people following you and listening? <laughs> when you mentioned D. Bradley Baker, he's yeah. got a website, I want to be a voice actor.com. Brilliant resource. It's the name of the site, and it's a, it, it, is, it is the resource. I mean, there, there, there are so many tips and tricks that you know, people should know what it is worth paying for, what they should not be paying for, where yeah. their money is best invested. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We've got a microphone set up. You guys, if you got questions, get up to the microphone. I've got a couple more for Jen. Well, if you're, I mean, if you're that close to the microphone, I'll just leave it to you, <laughs> Mr. Mr. The Hedgehog. Let's hear it, so I'm probably the outlier here. I only know you from one game when I was looking up on IMDb this morning. That's Genome from the 90s. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, my gosh. Well, I was playing that when I was, like, four. Oh, 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 really? Yeah. Oh, you're okay? Wow. You were advanced for your age. Oh, like sweet. Inspiration. I'm honored. So I was just wondering if you had any stories that, I mean, I know it was like a small part. Specific to that game? Yeah, Not specific to that game, but I can say, I can speak to the early, you know, the mid-90s and my first gaming experiences. Like with my very first game, Crown San Diego, I went in and, and I never forget, we've been doing the series and everything's sequential and everything makes sense and you get the script ahead of time and I'm like, I don't have a script, okay. And I went in and... I had to say the names of, you know, however many flags, and I was like, what? okay, so I just say the name of the flag? What? What? I didn't understand any of it. I was like, it was all non-sequential. I didn't understand it, and I really just had to go, okay, I'll do this. I'll just completely live a thousand percent in the right now. Ah! And that was the secret. I was like, I unlocked it on that one. So, and I've seen this amazing... Um, change in acting styles in, you know, acting has evolved much in the same way that film acting evolved in the 20th century, game acting has in the 21st. Like we started out with this, I must be like children's theater because the visuals are not quite up to speed yet, you know, with human beings in games. And then as they got really, you can see it actually during the Mass Effect trilogy, one to three, you can feel the difference in the acting. In three, it's more like, I can just think something. And you know exactly what's going on. You know, it's like the change has been like, oh! So yeah, that's what I Yeah, thank you. What, are you actively on a game right now? Have you got something that's out there? You, you, already, walked, oh, you already walked away from the microphone. Get back here. Get, 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 get. Come here, come here. Yeah, what do you want? Rule number one, again, if you listen to The Art of Money, is learn self-promotion. So what are, you, what are you working on? What are you doing? Okay, it's called Towards the Pantheon. It's a 2D RPG, kind of like Chrono Trigger. The prequel just came out on Steam, and it's free, so everybody can do it. And, and, okay, and what, what was it called again? Towards the Pantheon? Towards the Pantheon. Uh, are you on Twitter? Yeah. Okay, I am at jhaletweets. Tweet it at me, and I'll and tweet it a couple times in case I miss it, and I'll retweet it and get it out there. Okay. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. absolutely. We all support each other. Especially in Canada. <laughs> Hi. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Okay. <laughs> I have two questions after that first one where I was asking how you were. Um, <laughs> I'll tell you the story. Um, first of all, we recorded separately. I never got to record with anyone else. And uh, we were directed by Caroline Livingstone out of Edmonton, I bought by our Edmonton. She would Skype in. So normally the flow was, you know, blah, 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 do a take, blah, 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 do a B take, pause. Caroline would go, okay, we need blah, 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 we're gonna redo, blah, 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 okay. And we'd go, that was our rhythm, boom, 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 boom. So we get to this line, the ending stuff was heavy anyway. Oh, and I get to the slime and I, you know, as I said, the trick for me is living a thousand percent in the moment. So I dropped into that moment and I went to speak and I was like, oh, I was about to burst into tears and I was like, Shepard does not cry. <laughs> <laughs> so I just paused and I go, give me a second. And I backed away from it and I came back and I said what I had to say. Didn't like two takes. 
and I'm waiting for Caroline. I'm like, uh oh, did we lose our Skype connection? I go, Caroline? She goes, yeah, just give me a second. <laughs> You, you break your director, you've succeeded. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And then my second question is, can I give you a high five? <laughs> totally! Get up here and high five me. Yeah! yeah. <laughs> you guys are awesome. Yeah, they're always out of order unless we're doing a cinematic. You know, in a, the cinematics, you can record them as like a little mini movie, but yeah, everything else, I'm so used to out of order, I don't even think about it. You know, I'm so used to living like, I'll get a down uh, description of what's what, you know, in terms of the arc of the story. And I, I can usually track where we are in the timeline from what I'm seeing around me. And, um, but occasionally I have to go to the director, all right, all right, wait, wait, wait. Now, or they'll give me a direction or a redirect. I'll be like, oh, where are we on the timeline? Oh, we're over here. I thought we were over here. Never mind. Let me do that again. You know, so. Do you find it's like a lot harder, though, with the game, like, Mass Effect, you know, having like, the different dialogue trees and stuff? Like, does that make a difference for you? No, I don't think of it in terms of hard or easy. Because if I did that, I'd be exhausted. <laughs> um, I simply just literally drop a thousand percent into the moment and live that moment and then move on. Because if I don't, you guys don't get to. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, so one thing that um, I wanted to ask was, um, so Mail Shepherd uh, ended up being the most used uh, math Ooh, effect. Theoretically. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're still waiting on the exact no, no, math on that. No, no. Um, I actually saw the number because it's easy for new beginners because it defaults to John Shepherd and like everyone just clicks A and then goes on. And but. As the series progressed, Fenshep became the most favorite among fans just due to the voice acting oh, alone. Yeah. Like everyone agreed that both you were Paragon and Renegade Shepherd, it was both equally good. And uh, how did that make you feel to be like awesome. the most <laughs> Awesome. I mean, that's the sister right there, makes me so. Thank you. I'm honored and I'm so happy. That's, that's thrilling. Uh, yeah. Another question was, uh, I worked as QA on Mass Effect for all three Thank days. You. And, um, Thank you. Thank you for doing that. The Citadel playthrough was probably my favorite one working on, but uh, I had to test all the romances, mostly the Garrus romances. Oh, I mean, what a, oh. what a, what a burden oh, to shoulder. Yeah, right? Like, no complaints at all. Guys are both staying in Garrus for my favorites to test. Mm. And, um, and there's a scene in the Citadel DLC with, um, with Thane's romance where it's his final goodbyes in the funeral, funeral scene. And how did it feel recording that, like actually having to say goodbye to such an iconic character before the series is even done? Oh, it's so hard. It's so sad. You know, in those moments, I have to have things in place in my heart, in my body, in my experience. I don't do it from the outside like this is what sad looks like. I have to connect in myself deeply to something where I'm getting choked out, literally saying goodbye. So that's hard. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Also, Shepard doesn't cry, but she cried in that scene. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had to go for a walk and buy an ice cream sandwich while I was Aww, crying. Aww, I'm so glad. Thank you. Ice cream sandwiches make everything better. <laughs> Hello, thank you for coming to Vancouver. Um, this is might be an uh, obscure question, because I know you do a lot of video games, but you also do cartoons. I do a ton of cartoons, yeah. um, And I was wondering, uh, for Wander Over Yonder, you oh. rip off. Yes! I'm going to rip off. And um, right away I recognized your voice, I was like, is that Commander Shepard? Yeah. And, but I also recognized that she was kind of based off of Ellen Ripley from yeah. Aliens. Yeah. And I was wondering, um, what she, since Ellen Ripley is such a prominent character in pop culture, I was wondering, um, uh, what did you borrow from her, and what did you take to make Emily rip off your own, and um, how did it affect, like, 
It was a mashup. If you take Ripley and throw her into that universe, into the wonder of a yonder universe with those brilliant people behind it, she gets really twisted and weird, and that's exactly what I did. Yeah. That's so good. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. it's that show, and I was so glad I heard your voice. I was like, oh. Thank you. Thank you so much. Also, can I get a hug? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Wouldn't it be weird if I was like, oh, I don't hug people? No. No, no physical contact, no affection. Some people are not comfortable with that. Yeah. Fair enough. You can actually put your foot on the little part of the stand right there and then pull that thing up. Getting a master class in oh, mic yeah. stand adjustment. You can today. actually pull the whole arm these, up. These are, these are like yeah, yeah, I think it might be tight. It might be good. tightened at the beginning. Uh, you're good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. So, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, you were part of Codename Kids Next Door. I was in a couple of capacities. Number eighty-six. Number eighty-six. Yes. And then uh, the computer. Mm-hmm. And then, like a lot of uh, uh, characters in the episodes as well. Mm-hmm. You have yeah, the, we always do incidentals. Incidentals. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any approaches to uh, like how you approach? Those, we're done. Uh, those uh, like doing many characters at once. Yeah, there's a few things that are paramount. I mean, number one, you start with the like Tom. I kind of love Tom. He's insane, the creator of the show, and uh, it's all very over the top. So number eighty six was in here, you know, and she was always crazy and insane, and like I don't know if she was Scottish or Irish. What is her problem? <laughs> but she was always angry, you know, and so uh, I think she was Irish, but she, yeah, she traveled a lot. Um, and, but when you're doing multiple characters, the number one thing is separation. And then I go to the computer, and she sounds completely different. And then if I needed to do another character, he's going to be placed somewhere else, like, Auntie Sax is, she's right, right there, you know? But I'm going to place him, like, more here, you know, and change the pitch, and also change his rhythm, you know, make him speak slower, so separation is one of the keys. So, do I have? Just put it on your tap. (laughs) Thank you. I have a question about the Mass Effect series, uh, the ending of the third one. So people actually believe that the end series, when they're facing the computer AI program, is actually more of indoctrination Mm -hmm. at the end. What is your opinion on this theory? I think it's a perfectly viable theory. I think I think that's the beauty of the ending of Mass Effect 3. There was a lot of comments about it and a lot of stuff in the community about it. My favorite thing about it, honestly, was that look how engaged everybody is. <laughs> that's what I was like, oh, look at all the engagement. That's amazing. Writing is hard. Writing endings is extraordinarily difficult without them being cheesy or stupid or really, you know. Writing a series with tens, hundreds of thousands of co-creators I don't even want to imagine how difficult that task is. And one of my favorite things is that Bioware responded, and they came up with the DLC, and they addressed, they were, they listened to you guys. They listened to you. Yeah, but that, that's my that's my take on it. Also, can I get a salute? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I myself am a working voice actor in the industry, and I find myself really inspired by your performance as Shepard. Thank you. Because I get so, hearing you got me really into the moment in the games. Great. And I wanted to know if you ever have days where it's really hard for you to get into that moment. Oh, yeah. How do you kind of force yourself into there? Because I have trouble with that sometimes. Oh, people are counting on you. (laughs) Listen, just because it's not easy doesn't mean that it's a problem for you. You still do it, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. You get it done. Yeah. And it's, uh, do you find that if you've gone in in a funk and you've forced yourself into the mode that you had to be in for the job, you come out feeling a little better? The energy that's sitting on you when you're in a funk or you just can't get there is a heavy energy typically, or it's just a really disconnected from where you're at. And you've got a lot of noise in your head, and what you're forced to do is to come out of your own head and look out there for other people. I find it's helpful sometimes to consider that you know, we all experience the world like what we see is what is. It is not. <laughs> this camera in here only sees this. There's cameras out there seeing from a million different angles. So put yourself in one of the other cameras for a minute and see it from that angle. That'll loosen me up sometimes. Um, and then sometimes I just have to, I just literally go to zero. I just go, I, I can't, okay, there's a, okay, there's a whole, 
uh, it's an image on Google of the vibration of different feelings. And it sounds really weird, but it's like this weird cone thing. We're getting into the really woo-woo stuff here, but maybe it's just woo, not woo-woo. Because uh, anyway, the vibration of guilt and shame are way down here, and then you got the vibration of like fear, and then you move up to frustration, and you or anger, and then you move up to frustration. Wait, no. So it's guilt, shame, um, depression, then rage, anger, frustration, annoyance apathy, meh, neutral, then love, joy, all the really cool fun stuff, right? People try to go from depression and achy, crappy, horrible to joy. Yeah, good luck with that. You'll pull a muscle. Um, <laughs> just try to get yourself up a couple levels just to zero. So my really hard days, because I've had very difficult days, I've been through a lot, you know, and processing that stuff is painful, and most of us aren't actors because we have an amazingly perfect, easy life. Yeah. You know, we have stuff to bring to the party. So I would just go to zero and just start there. And, ta and I'd literally shut me out. The me really is your ego. It's that your I identify as this. And when we're actors, our job is to lose all that and identify as, take those pieces that are useful and go identify as something else. So yeah, I, I hope that's helpful. Just go to zero and see what happens. Thank yeah, you. let it go for a few hours. <laughs> let it go. <laughs> Hi. Hi. You were I was about to, to take it out of that. Yeah, I was about to say, look, if you're going to start a, a yeah. music number, I mean, right? <laughs> sing and dance, we got a stage. Yeah, we'll start singing in a minute, I'm down for that. Good morning, good um, morning. Uh, I've also got a couple of questions about the art. Um, uh, following on from the, the emotional side of it, I was wondering if you did anything, if you spent much time, like before starting recording, trying to get a feel on the character and their voice and that sort of thing? like. Looking or to... Oh yeah, always. I always check in with that. You know, I'll, typically on the way to a session, I'll put on some music in the car or some interesting YouTube video to listen to. Um, listen to and watch because um, I'm driving. You know. um, but music is really good. I just have to be careful with the music that I listen to because it causes such dramatic mood shifts. You know, it's like, oh, am I doing? What's the style? And if I'm going to Cartoon Network, I'm not listening to Peter Gabriel. I'm <laughs> just not. Um, you know, and um, yeah, so, uh, tell me the question one more time, I lost track of it. <laughs> oh, yeah, I lost in my own brain. When you're developing the characters. Okay. Yeah, I, I start with uh, the writing, it's all in the writing, it is in that script. A teacher of mine, you know, 30 years ago said, read the script five times before you open your mouth. And, and you read it for the detail and for the style, and then I typically am familiar with the creator or the writer or the director or the network, and what's their style? How do they approach it? What are they looking for? Everybody's got their own flavor, so let's get in the zone of that flavor. And you know, what is an elephant in this universe, or what is a mom in that universe? And then the specific details that come out of the drawing, and I just turn myself over to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was wondering about is, uh, I know that some actors and singers especially have like voice maintenance sort of thing. Oh, yeah. Um, I, the late Lenny drank a bottle of Jack and a pack of smokes every day. Um, That's not my thing. <laughs> uh, you know, I think you have like, quite a broad variety of voices. The ones that come to mind are like Shepherd of June from mm -hmm. Avatar, and you have Bastila. Um, and Princess Morbucks. Yeah, and so there's quite a variety there. I'm wondering if, if you ever have to kind of figure out how to get back into Yeah, well, I, I, you've got uh, the, the voice memo thing on your phone, right? I keep a little reference of several characters, because I've got recurring characters like on uh, Guardians of the Galaxy and Mantis, and, you know, but I'm not in there every week. I might be in there, you know, two, three weeks in a row, and then nothing for three months, and I'll have to remember, you know, even Friday from Avengers, I'm like, oh, I gotta call that back up. So I have my reference. And then um, I also stay in shape vocally. I went back to my voice teacher for the first time in 10 years just to get a set of exercises and I do them at home and they sound god awful, but it's, the, it's Broadway belt training. You know, and it builds all these muscles and keeps everything strong so I can scream without hurting myself. Yeah, so. And also, I was wondering, do you ever have a chance to improvise on voice acting? A little bit, on Bioshock, we got to do that. Oh. And of course in animation. We get to all the time in animation, it's a blast. Yeah, okay. yeah. Cool, thanks. Hey. Is anybody else warm? Is it warm in here? Is it a little warm in here to anybody else? All right. Yeah, it's warm in here. There's a way to take. adjust the, the temperature, anybody? Um, thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, nervous. Um, That's so okay. Obviously, Yay! Well done, well done. That has nothing to do with my question. Okay. I know two characters that had a big part of my childhood that 
that your voice was Sam from Totally Stop. Yay! As well as one of the Hex Girls. <laughs> Thank you, so, Thorn. And two of them question, like, what was your favorite part about voicing those two characters? Singing is Thorn. I mean, come on. Well, actually, it was great. I used to, when I was uh, in high school, I sang, I started really early in high school, singing in a cover band, and we would do old go-go stuff. And I've never told Jane this story. But, you know, Jane Weedland, who's in the Hex Girls, was, um, you know, in the go-go's, you know, of course. And so I remember being at the Hex Girls session going like, oh my gosh, I used to cover your songs, and now you're like my backup singer. <laughs> that was really cool. And then Sam was just a blast because we just had really special chemistry and there were two iterations of that cast. There was the US cast and then the Canadian cast and both are just, we're still all friends to this day. Just, it was great. And then being able to play Sam and Mandy at the same time, mm -hmm. that was really fun. That's really cool. Uh -huh. still friends. And, mm -hmm. I, and I love the Hex Girls music on my phone. <laughs> yeah, let's see, what was that? Uh, There's a monster scaring everybody. Spooky footprints, kind of strange and muddy. And a terrified town that doesn't know what to do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, hi. Are you can. You can point, to lift that thing up, or you have to step on it. Yeah. You're also okay. armed for battle, so. That's right. Okay. Careful. Uh, I, was I was wondering what what was some of your favorite lines to record as Shepherd. I'm sick of your disingenuous insertion, assertions. <laughs> insertions. Well, that's appropriate for today. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, and of course, the ubiquitous, I should go. <laughs> so, I kind of get a uh, thank you and a question. So, the oh. first thing is, um, my brother and I, we don't get along at anything. Like, we're not like, <laughs> constantly arguing. You but must be a lot of life, aren't you? Uh, no. no. I don't think you can agree with me. We're completely alike. This, this is like, sorry. The one thing that him and I could always agree on was Mass Effect. Aww. That's the one thing in our life that we connect on was Mass Effect. I so thank that. you for that. Did you play Femme Chef? I did play Femme Chef. Real men play Femme Chef. Real men play Femme Chef. Ah, yes! Good man! Good man! Thank you. Um, was, I have mean, a question is I'm guessing you played the Mass Effect and actually played it. No? Once for an hour. <laughs> I had to, I was forced to for an interview for the department. Oh, okay. yeah. uh, that's kind of question you actually played. And and this, uh, the New Yorker did an article about me and I had to, I had to uh, play for an hour and it drove me nuts because I just wanted to go back and re-record it. I was like, well, if I'd known that detail, I would have done it slightly differently. <laughs> that's why I don't play my own stuff. Plus, I'm really bad at it and I get motion sick. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Details. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks, man. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you personally for doing a great job. I thank you. And I could actually ask my question. I wanted to know your favorite lines. Oh, so. my favorite lines in Mass Effect? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I should go. I'm sick of Digitus and Genuous Assertions. Um, oh, my very favorite, though. Tell your friends we're coming for them. <laughs> Bring it. Let's right. do the quick one first. Okay. Uh, what was the most fun time you had before? Uh, anything? Yeah. Animation with uh, people like Rob Paulson and Maurice Marsh and Greg Lyle and Carrie Walgren. It's just like a bunch of kindergartners trapped in a room. <laughs> and some <laughs> poor person had to make us all behave. <laughs> it's really bad. How many of you came to the library to Princess Bride yesterday? Yeah. Yeah. That's an, honestly what it's like in the session. <laughs> You're just trying to keep your mouth shut. And th that stuff goes on at a much louder volume all around you. And then the director hits the button. It's like, <laughs> silence. And then you're like. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we keep, Miss Keen actually, I've been back in as Miss Keen, okay. um, but Princess Morbucks went to somebody else, and then I ended up doing another character that was a, another person used to do, and it's been quite the mashup, but I, I have to step back and go, I'm not the, the decision maker, I didn't sell that show, I didn't put the money up for it, so I have to respect that they're the leadership, and all right, I just show up and do my absolute best with what they put in front of me. Start. What's that? Is it still hard book? Um, I put it in a box, you know, and I enjoy it. Actually, it's, it's not as hard because the people there are lovely. They're really lovely people, like really lovely people. And 
they're a new generation of talent, and there's a couple of them that are just insanely talented, and then some of us old folks are back, which is really great. Yeah. Old, come on. <laughs> come yeah. on, Jen. Oh, one of the girls is still a teen, you know, in high school, so I'm like, okay, wow, I could be your mom. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hi, sorry, I'm, I'm nervous. That's okay. I am too, so we're, in a, we're, we're a good match. Should I be? <laughs> um, so, again, I'm also a really big fan of the Mass Effect, but, uh, but other than that, I'm also a really big fan of uh, uh, other Bioware games, especially like Dragon Age. Yes. Uh, yes. 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 Oh, yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you, there was a sort of a difference to approaching like Krem's characters to like other characters oh, yeah. that you've played before? Oh, yeah. Every character has their own approach. Like every character, I, I, I'm literally Groundhog Day. Sometimes people will put something in front of me, I'm like, did I work on that? Because we have so many NDAs, I will wipe my brain when I leave the session. I leave the script there, I don't, I don't see it ahead of time. Like, psh, I just show up and I'm like, Dory, I'm like, totally in the moment, you know? Um, but there's a stylistic difference, and with Dragon Age, I had a huge responsibility. I mean, to, to be asked to play, a, you know, one of their first primary transgender characters was just, wow. That was a, I was honored and I was taken aback and it was like a, a thing. I had to really, I put some I put a lot of research in, a lot of time and a lot of thought. So, yeah. I, I must say it certainly shows. And Thank you. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for playing. Come in here. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, <laughs> watching Rebels the other night. Yeah. And Death Trooper. Yeah. Um, any stories of working on Rebels, Clone Wars, or anything? Oh, yeah. Clone Wars is great. Oh yeah, they're incredible. I mean, those are, I love them. You know, I, it's funny, I'm mostly I'm sort of in for games a lot, but I do a ton of animation and working on that show. Are you kidding? It's just everybody from the director oh, to the writers, working on anything like that is great. One of my favorite things about working for those guys is they love dialects and we're always coming up with some weird new sound for a character. Yeah. Is there anything you can tell us about Bastila? Nope. What it was like working with no? Oh, what it was like in the past? Yes, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Jen is good at very, very I, many things, but one, uh, you know, staying within her NDAs is probably the top. Yes. Okay. I, uh, I am my own grandma, which is kind of hilarious because I'm Satila and Bastila. And working as Bastila is really cool. I almost go into the accent now. Um, it's very exciting. Um, because it was one of my first experiences of playing a character who's light and dark. And I was like, wait, what? We did all the light stuff and came back and did the dark stuff. I'm like, she, what? What am I doing? Is it okay to act like this? Like, no, yeah, go ahead. And I was like, all right. <laughs> it's really fun. Yeah, thank you. Hello? You kind of already touched on it a bit, but I was yeah. curious if there's a huge difference between doing voice acting for cartoons and oh, yeah. anything. Huge difference. I mean, for one thing, in animation, we get the scripts ahead of time. And so that's nice. We get to kind of settle in and read it. Storyboards too, is some quite often, and and it's an ensemble thing. Like we're all sitting here and we're all sharing the load, and it's it's like yay, it's like a radio play. It's really fun, and everyone's crazy. And it's like we don't I'm really kindergarten, and it's about they're both about four hour sessions. And in a game, you don't get the script 98 95 percent of the time. You don't get the script ahead of time, so it's what we call cold reading. You just show up. And you, get a, you have a knowledge of the basic universe. You, you, mostly we audition, so you remember the, what it is, kind of. And you get a refresher on where you are, a refresher on the style of it, etc. And then you get a script, and you cold read. And you're like, okay, so this is the line, here we go. This is the line, here we go. And you're out of context, and it's a four-hour, one-person show. I always joke that uh, um, I got a Guinness record because I'm addicted to real estate. Um, because in the beginning, it was, um, it's, it's pretty demanding work, and a lot of my peers were like, no, thank you. I was like, I'll do it. I'll do it. I want to buy some real estate. I'll do it. <laughs> so that's, that's how I got so many jobs. <laughs> <laughs> that? Yes, absolutely. Yep, there it is. Take it back. That's it. Ownership, go. man. Hello. Um, Hi. I really love you in Mass Effect. And Thank you. Like a strong woman. <laughs> Say that like a strong woman. Yes. <laughs> and I really love you as um, sorry, uh, Rosalind Lucas in Bioshock Infinite. Thank you. Thank <laughs> and you. And I was also wondering maybe you could say this line. As which character? Uh, 
As Shepard, here we hear y'all. Ah, I'm Commander Shepard, and Vancouver Fan Expo is my favorite expo on the Citadel. <laughs> Our marketing intern has done her job. Right? You get a job, kid. Hi. Hi. Um, I actually just got into your podcast, so I'm not very part of it. Yay. But um, my question was mostly, um, well, I, I'm terrible at money, so I find it really, really interesting. I'm so glad. Um, I just want to know what inspired you to make a podcast. For those of you who don't know, I have a podcast right now. It's called The Art of Money. I'm actually writing a book, and I, I had this title pop in my head the other day. I'm like, maybe I'll change the name of the podcast to... I love money because you're awesome. You know? <laughs> it's the weirdest title ever, but maybe I will. So I, um, my dad, I have two dads. My second dad um, called, used to call me very affectionately as a kid. I think we talked about this, the little capitalist piglet. And I've always experienced money as a way to have safety and security. So I've studied it a lot because those things are important to me. In the study of money, real estate ends up being my happy place. To make smart decisions about that, I need to understand what's going on with the global economy. So I read all these books, and I read all these articles, and I subscribe to all this stuff. And I usually only have time to read a book on an airplane. And these books, you guys, and this is very US-centric, but because of the global power of the US, this is a global issue, and it's a global issue everywhere, honestly. Uh, even here in Canada, where I have personally been, I've been personally impacted by corruption and cor government and corporate corruption directly out here in Canada. It's heartbreaking. Anyway, I read these books on an airplane and I just want to stand up and go, you guys, you need to know this. They're doing all this stuff to you and it's going to kill you later and it's killing you now and they're lying. You need to know, but they'll arrest you for that. <laughs> so rather than get arrested on an airplane, I started a podcast because the wool is being pulled over everyone's eyes. We are currently, if you want to take it out to its, you know, not even 30,000, but 50,000 foot level up in the air, my personal opinion is right now, we're engaged in a global battle between two forces. One is corruption, particularly corporate corruption, and the other is open source living. If you look at the internet and how powerful the internet has become since its existence and things like Wikipedia, and all these incredible open source things and the way people are growing their businesses when they have free and open access to ways to connect, etc. And then you look at the corporate welfare machine that is depleting resources, killing people, poisoning people, lying to people, misinforming people. And then we trickle all that down to our own decisions. If you, that's the big meta-meta picture. And it trickles all the way down to individual decisions. Like when I make a decision that serves me purposefully at the expense of others, how do I feel? How do I make my world better or worse? When I make a decision that, even though it's difficult in the moment, I know it makes things better and I just trust everything's gonna work out, how do I feel? I'm lifted. You can literally feel the vibration change in that moment. You can literally feel it. So, uh, I made the podcast to empower artists, creative people, and everyday people around money. Because if we lived in a world where all those people had power, as well as the people who currently have power, it'd be a very different world. So my mission is to empower people, and it gets overwhelming. You're like, uh, uh, money, oh, I don't even know. Uh, I, no, just don't even talk to me about that. And what we do in there is hopefully we break it down into little tiny manageable chunks. And just tune into the podcast, take a chunk and go. Tune in, take a chunk and go. And I started the first two episodes, as I had my Twitter followers. I'm like, I'll just shoot it out there. So, you know, I don't know, email me your name and your number and your question. You know, and I got a few people in the beginning. We did this tiny little two first episodes. And then the next four episodes were at cons. And I invited first just this tiny group of people. And then I had like 50 people. The last one, I'm like, oh my God. All right. And I put people in the hot seat and we talk about this. And my framework is that money is like a table. It has four legs. One leg is knowledge, which you are not given. And you are not given that on purpose. And I go into that in the podcast. There's a very specific reason. The next leg is a plan. How do you even have a plan about something you don't even know about? Well, we're going to get you there. The next leg is habits. Look at your habits. And your habits are not entirely your fault. In fact, until you have this knowledge, I'm going to say they're mostly not your fault. Because you have been trained since you were born to feed the corporate machine. You have been trained to consume. You've been trained that if you just buy this one more thing, you'll finally be good enough. Oh, and then they move the carrot. You know? You gotta have the latest and the greatest at the expense of your own safety and your own health and your own ability to relax and have well-being. 
You know, those are the habits. And once you have the knowledge, it's on you. <laughs> so you may or may not want to tune in. No. <laughs> and then the final leg is being, like culture. Like who in your family, does your family, do you, do you operate in a culture that goes, oh, those rich people? You're never going to have money because you have an unconscious understanding that if you're wealthy, people are looking bad at you and talking crap about you. So I, I learned a long time ago, I, I do not talk crap about people who are successful or who are wealthy unless they're doing something crappy. You know, I embrace them because that, yes, more please. I know mine's there too. I know mine's here and it's all done. So yeah, thank you, I hope that's helpful. Thank you for that. Thank you. If I can take a, a momentary diversion, uh, be, be selfish for a moment. One of the things that, that I find is that uh, as, as somebody who does independent consulting, I find myself chasing chasing people who just want to use me as a tool. Mm -hmm. It's it's less that I'm a person. It's less that they care about me and uh, and and building on on what I need to build on. They are really just interested in in what they want to do. Because you are two things, same as an actor. You are a commodity and you are a human being, and that's a boundary thing. That's a boundary decision. Um, they may not care about you a human as a human. They may never. But if you're providing a service, they're gonna care about you as a commodity and it's on you to value that commodity and to piece out the taste of it and then you remove it. And then there are people who will never come through and pay you because that's just not who they are. They're gonna move on to the next person they can suck from. And that's what their world looks like. That's the world they create. You will gravitate to people who will begin, then you'll sort the weeds out. Like, my people, not my people. My people, not my people. And we're in a time of division. I mean, I don't know if you guys are seeing this as much up here, but good God, we're seeing it down south. Yeah, we're seeing just a touch of it down south Holy of the border. Holy cow. You know, this is a time when it is becoming very clear. You can't not, I don't know if it's unfortunate. It just is what it is. You can't not take a side now. Because to be a good person doing nothing is to empower those doing the wrong thing. I took a stand last week about something. I put my stuck my neck out in a big way, but I had to. You know, it's behind the scenes, but I had to do it, and I did it, and I'm going to keep doing it. Because to sit back and do nothing empowers people doing the really crappy stuff, and I'm done. I'm done. One of the things that, that you've gotten into on the podcast and that you talk about every time we're on stage together is, is the notion of finding something where you have your own agency, you have your own power, you are driving the narrative. And, and one of the things that I started doing was podcasting of my own, selling my own ads, not relying on somebody else to sell them, not relying on somebody else to do the programming, the engineering side of what I'm doing, finding the things that I could be self-sufficient in, even if it took extra elbow grease. Mm -hmm. And it has been so much more freeing. I'm not, you know, it, it's great if 20th Century Fox Home Video owes me $40,000, but if they owe me $40,000 for nine months, that's nine months that I don't have my living. Yeah, you're gonna get that, go after that because you have a contract. You know, it's interesting, we've been, and this, I love this word, we've been infantilized. We've been turned into children as far as money and civic responsibility goes. Someone's gonna do it, I don't know. And that really serves the corporate machine because they just continue to get to take advantage and profit off of it. But the more we grow up and step up, the more powerful we get. And the beautiful thing is you still get to be a complete kid. Now you can just afford it and do more fun kid stuff. You you're know? not asking anybody permission. No, I mean, you're giving yourself permission. And right? for your own kidness. And so you really are those two people again. You're the grown up going, all right, I gotta handle my business, I gotta do my billing, I gotta do this, I gotta call a lawyer, whatever I have to do, okay. Separate that from, all right, it's my time. You know, because then you can afford it. You've earned it. Yes. Hi. Yeah, point that thing where you need it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'd like to know what uh, uh, upcoming uh, uh, voiceover characters and animation you're doing? Oh, animation. I can talk about animation. Um, well, mostly. Uh, <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what it, everything's under an NDA. You have to do, have to do that mental so check of, okay, yes. is this and okay? Is this okay? the no category unless it's on the air. Guardians of the Galaxy, Mantis, um, uh, Lost in Oz. I am Glinda in that one, which is so much fun. It's on Amazon. Um, can't talk about that. I just did the Star Wars Rebels, finally aired. And, um, can I talk about that? No, oh, I don't know what I can talk about. There's some cool stuff coming. I just, I prefer to err on the side of- Cool coffee. stuff coming early next year, you think? I would say. Early yeah, next year. Early next year to spring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Watch the skies, watch J. Hale tweets. Here we go, J. Hale tweets. I'll throw it out there on my, on my web, on Twitter. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and now you step on it and pull it the other way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, I was just wondering, uh, of all the romantic options available to Commander Shepard in the Mass Effect trilogy, uh, which one was your favorite to perform, or which one did you feel was the most uh, well-written? You know what I always say? Don't make me pick. 
<laughs> I love them all. I love Liara because it was groundbreaking and because we made Fox News so mad. <laughs> Thank you. Jennifer, you're succeeding in life. You're succeeding in life if you've done that. Yeah. Um, and I loved, I loved the writing in the Garrison Thane stuff. It was just so powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello again. Hello again. I, can't, I thought of the second question. Oh, let's hear it. As you played Krem and you're part of the Bulls Charger, how was it like working with those other voice actors? I know you didn't do sessions with them, but you must have met some of them. And I'm wanting to know mainly about the Iron Bull. About Freddy, yeah. I love Freddy. He was in, you know, he worked on Mass Effect as well. And he's a big gamer. And he, he's just one of the nicest guys. I love him. He's just an intensely kind and intelligent and funny person. You know, he's intensely kind. He's just, I walked in one day, this is not Dragon Age, it's Mass Effect. Oh, first of all, to be a part of the Dragon Age universe, I was like, yes! You know, and to be on that team, on that crew, was just amazing and playing that character. Yes, more please. Uh, email them and tell them you want more crime. Um, <laughs> but uh, I walked into work one day for Mass Effect and I, Freddie and I had our sessions overlapped and so we got to chat for a bit and he was talking about that he had played as Femshep but he had such a hard time because it was some scene where he had to punch me. He was like, I, I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. <laughs> he just completely freaked out. I was like, gotcha. <laughs> Also, uh, just one that just popped in my head, sorry for the people behind me. Uh, do you like playing more proactive characters that bring up social problems yes. in society? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, I do. Thanks. Thank you. So we're going to be able to get to both of your questions. I love that we got through the whole line, and, awesome. and then we're at time. Yeah, step on the bottom and just pull that thing down like you mean it. Boom, there, there we go. go. Nicely done. You're going to graduate okay. this time. <laughs> You're going to get a diploma when you leave. Yeah. I would say, hardest to record was the Garris ending, and the Thane was really difficult as well. I would say though, the, the ending period, all the Anderson stuff, all that stuff, was just so moving, because we had a system called VEDA, it's a proprietary system where if a voice actor has been in before you and you're in the cast, you actually get to hear them back. So I would get to hear him, you know, Keith, and I would, I, just to be able to interact with him that way, it was just like, <gasps> It was incredible. Yeah. Thank you. I know I asked for a high five for can I please get a hug? Yes. <laughs> Collect everything, you know? Like Pokemon, catch them all. <laughs> all right, last one. This is a, it's going to be a good one, right? No, don't, no pressure. It's it is good, what no, it is. no pressure at all. Let's hear what you got. No, it's going to be great. <laughs> I didn't realize what you were crowded, and I want to really thank you for that because I myself am a trans guy, and I've never, ever, ever seen a trans guy in anything before, and I'm going to start crying right now, um, because it meant so much to me to see a character like that. Can I give you a hug? <laughs> before we go, what, what's your name? <laughs> My name is Conrad, Conrad Dickinson. Let's hear for Conrad Dickinson. Woo! You're going to take the game voice acting world by storm for us? <laughs> yeah, I do Can it. you promise us that? All right. <laughs> be you. That's all you need to be. So, you're here for the rest of the day? I am. I'm here for the rest of the day. I'm signing over. Where am I signing? In, in, the, in the exhibit hall. It's Everybody's all What's around the same place. What's the name of it? It's like a, the, like the downstairs. Downstairs by the photo op stuff. I'm down there along with Nolan North, Troy Baker, Rob Paulson, Maurice Lamarge, uh, Charlotte Charlotte Chung. Chung. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're all down there. It's sort of a secret that we're down there, but we're there. Come see us. So yeah, if, if you if you came up with a question right at the last minute, just as we were ending, yeah. the good news is you still have time to ask Jen that question. Right. Go down and see her. Even if you did get a chance to ask a question, even if you have seen her at another show, even if you've seen her seven times, go and see Jen. She is one of my favorite, favorite people Aww, that we have at these shows okay. uh, for about a billion different reasons. <laughs> Let's raise the roof one more time for her. Send her back down to the table. Thank you.